Club of New York in our 111th year. If there's one thing we can do around here is we can count. Uh, I am uh, Glenn Hutchins, Vice Chairman of the Club and Chairman of North Island. The Economic Club of New York is the nation's non-leading, uh, leading non-partisan, leading non-partisan <laughs> platform for discussion of economic, commercial, social, and political issues. More than 1,000 prominent guests have spoken to the club over the last century, forging a tradition of excellence which will continue today. Um, before we get started, I'd like to recognize the members of the Centennial Society seated in the front here. Um, they have each contributed $10,000 to the Centennial Fund, which serves as the financial backbone of the club. The other thing we know about the, uh, from the Economics Club is someone has to pay the bills. Thank you. I uh, would also like to greet the 2018 Economic Club of New York Fellows, uh, a new program which enables the club to introduce ourselves to a new generation of leaders in the business community. Greetings to, those, to that group. Uh, it's with great pleasure today that I welcome back the Economic Club, today's guest and my friend, Mark Carney, uh, Governor of the Bank of England. In addition to his role at the Bank of England, Mark serves uh, for the G20 as chair of the Financial Stability Board and as first vice chair of, Euro Euro of the European Systemic Risk Board. I highlight those two roles because they're quite relevant to his remarks today. We're very lucky to have him in those roles. Previously, Mark was the governor of the Bank of Canada and had a distinguished 13-year career at Goldman Sachs. Uh, born in the Northwest Territories of Canada, uh, Mark received a bachelor's degree from Harvard and a PhD from Oxford, in, both in economics. Personal highlights for Mark include being probably the best backup goalie in the history of Harvard hockey, uh, running a personal best of 3 hours, 31 minutes, and 22 seconds in the 2015 London Marathon, not bad. I barely beat that when I was 20 years younger. Uh, and rooting for the Everton Football Club, uh, which is also known as the Toffees. Now, for those of you who follow uh, football, that makes Mark a Toffee man, uh, which I'm sure is a status he's very proud of. Um, so, uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer recently announced that Mark had agreed to stay in place through 2020 to quote the Chancellor, quote, to support a smooth exit from the European Union and provide vital stability, stability to our economy through what could be quite a turbulent period, unquote. I'm sure that after today's session you'll understand why that was so important. A little bit of housekeeping. Our format today includes a speech by the governor followed by a conversation which I'll moderate. I would like to remind everyone that this event is on the record, especially we should remind Mark of that, uh, and that we do have live broadcast broad cameras and other media in the back of the room. You're also welcome to be with us today. Mark, the podium is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, thank you for that generous introduction. Note uh, a stickler for accuracy. Gen Glenn says, uh, probably the best backup goalie. Part. You can hide a lot with probably. Uh, and, I, and don't look up how many minutes I played uh, uh, for Harvard, because uh, it's measured, better me measured in seconds, actually. But uh, yeah, um, it's a great pleasure, it's a pleasure to be back uh, at the Economic Club of New York. Uh, I was last here five years ago, uh, roughly five years ago, just before uh, the holidays last year, uh, uh, to talk about our star um, a, a, at the time, a relatively obscure topic, uh, but one that you brought uh, to the mainstream and one we all think about. Um, but I'm in a slightly reflective mood because I just came back from, uh, I'm, I'm on my way, uh, I should say, uh, Glenn mentioned that I uh, have had the privilege of uh, being chair of the Financial Stability Board. Uh, which is a group of regulators, central banks, and, and treasuries of the G20 and beyond. Um, and I'm on my way to the uh, financial capital of eastern Ontario, Ottawa, uh, for, on Monday for, for my last uh, meeting as chair of the FSB. So that makes me slightly reflective. But I also, uh, with uh, some of you and uh, with all my central banking and, and finance minister uh, colleagues, uh, was in Bali last week for the annual meetings of the IMF and the World Bank. And uh, I think we're all conscious at the time that that was the 10th anniversary of uh, the global financial crisis uh, that October, uh, the 20th anniversary, and that was one of the reasons why it was in Bali, uh, the Indonesian hosts, uh, 
20th anniversary of the Asian financial crisis, the 30th anniversary of the Latin American debt crisis, and you know, I know this room can spot a pattern. Um, and so the question um, I want to ask uh, is a question that many have asked, um, is after 10 years of financial reform, whether anything has really changed, given that sort of weary uh, history. And I have to say that, you know, if you read the mass of articles and commentary uh, that came on the anniversary of Lehman's failure um, uh, and the subsequent weeks, um, many suggested that, uh, are suggesting that nothing has changed. Um, and I'm going to argue today that such weary fatalism is at odds with reality. Um, that the radical, and it has been a radical uh, program of G20 financial reforms, have made the system safer, simpler, and fairer. Um, that these measures are creating a system that better serves households and businesses across our economies, um, and that really that there has been true change, and that's creating true finance, which is a platform for openness and for innovation. But I'll, I'll also uh, go on to caution that we'll forfeit these gains if we once again fall under the spell of the three, three lies, what I'm calling the three lies of finance, um, that helped cause the global financial crisis. Um, and that to resist them, we have to maintain the new institutional frameworks that we put in place, and some of those are domestic, like here in the United States, uh, but the most important of those internationally um, is the FSB. So a basic point that we can't rest on our laurels, um, that financial history rhymes all too frequ frequently uh, with enormous cost. So let me, let me get into what happened and in in what I'm calling these three lies. And the, and the first lie is uh, the foremost expensive words in the English language. This time, it's different. Um, this misconception is usually the product of something good, an initial success, uh, early progress gradually builds into a blind faith of a new era of effortless prosperity, so the early stages of the uh, Minsky cycle. Now, if you think about the run-up to the crisis, there was a revolution in macroeconomic policy um, that occurred in the 80s uh, and 90s, particularly in the 90s, um, that helped win the battle against high and unstable infl inflation, rising unemployment, and volatile growth. Um, but price stability alone uh, was not a guarantee of financial stability. And that initially healthy focus on price stability eventually became a dangerous distraction. And so against a sort of serene backdrop of the, at the time, called the Great Moderation, uh, a storm was brewing and across the G7, there's many ways to illustrate this point, um, uh, but across the G7, uh, total non-financial debt of more than 100% of GDP built up in the run-up. Uh, to the crisis. And several factors drove that debt buildup. Um, demographics, the stagnation of middle class wages. Um, in the U.S., uh, as Raghu Rajan has argued, households had to borrow to uh, increase consumption. Let the meat cake became let the meat credit. Um, financial innovation made it easier to do so. And a ready supply of foreign capital made it cheaper. And most importantly, and this is this is the lie. Complacency amongst individuals and institutions, fed by a long period of macroeconomic stability and rising asset prices, made this remorseless borrowing seem sensible. And so when the prices broke, the policymakers uh, had to drop the received wisdoms of the Great Moderation and quickly relearn the lessons of the Great Depres Depression, and Minsky became mainstream. Now, a deep-seated faith in markets lay beneath the new era thinking of the great moderation, captured by the myth that finance can regulate and correct itself spontaneously. Authorities retreated from the regulatory and supervisory responsibilities. And that's, this is the second lie, that markets always clear. And it has two dangerous consequences. First, if markets always clear, they can be assumed to always be in equilibrium, said differently, assumed always to be right. If markets are efficient, bubbles can neither be identified nor can their potential causes be addressed. And such thinking led to the practical indifference amongst policymakers to the housing and credit booms, booms before the crisis. And the second dangerous consequence is that if markets always clear, they should possess a natural stability, 
and evidence to the contrary must be evidence of either market distortions or missing markets. And much of the financial innovation that we saw in the run-up to the crisis springs from the logic that a solution to market failures is to build new markets on old ones, a form of progress through infinite regress. During the Great Moderation, this view became an organizing principle for financiers and policymakers. And the latter, the policymakers, pursued a light-touch regulatory agenda in the quest for a perfect world of complete markets first described as abstract theory by Arrow and De Bruyne. And there's not many audiences in which you can quote Arrow and De Bruyne, and I'm glad to be in front of one today. Um, and of course, but as this audience knows, particularly, and this is one of the great things about uh, this group, bringing together the theory and the practice, um, as this audience knows, markets only clear or only always clear in textbooks. In reality, people are irrational, economy is imperfect, and nature itself is unknowable. And when such imperfections exist, adding markets can sometimes make things worse. And that was the case of synthetic credit derivatives, which were supposed to complete markets in default risk um, and improve pricing and allocation of capital. Um, however, the system had only spread risk contingently and opaquely in ways that ended up increasing it. And once the crisis began, risk quickly became concentrated on the balance sheets of intermediaries, banks, themselves who were capital constrained. And in a hyper-connected world, uh, risk ricocheted between the core and the periphery. So a truth of finance is that the riskiness of an asset depends on who owns it. And when markets don't clear, agents may be surprised to find out what they own and for how long. And when those surprises are or are thought to be widespread, panic ensues. Now, the third lie that I'm going to mention is that, um, is that markets are moral. And it takes for granted the social capital that financial markets uh, need to fulfill their promise. The crisis showed that if left unattended, markets can be prone to excess and abuse and repeated episodes of misconduct such as the LIBOR and FX scandals, called into question that social license that markets need to innovate and grow. So to, so to resume uh, for the moment, this time's no different. Markets don't always clear, and we can suffer from their amorality. And the question, of course, is what do you do with that knowledge, and how do you retain it? And my argument is that to resist the three, uh, the three lies of finance, policymakers, and market participants need to bind themselves to the mast. And that means building, uh, for policymakers, it means building institutional frameworks that make it easier to resist um, uh, these falsehoods as they regain their allure. And over the past decade, great strides have been made. Let me begin with uh, global reforms that have addressed the third, that markets are moral. There's a, there's a cycle of scandal, response, integrity, then drift, and then new scandal. Um, and in and that's been the case uh, throughout financial history. And the response to that scandals, those scandals, uh, the potential solutions tend to oscillate between the extremes of light touch regulation or self-regulation and total regulation. And of course, there's, there's problems with each. By undervaluing the importance of hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure to the functioning of real markets, light touch regulation directly led to the financial crisis. So think. Uh, undervaluing the ways that certain uh, benchmarks were set uh, or FX was fixed, um, and undervaluing um, soft infrastructure such as supervision. But if you go to the other extreme, total reliance on regulation and large ex post fines, recall that since the crisis, uh, global banks have paid over $325 billion of fines related to the crisis, equivalent to five trillion of lending capacity. Um, that approach um, is similarly bound to fail because it promotes a culture of complying with the letter of the law, not its spirit, and because authorities, such as myself, inevitably will lag behind uh, market developments. So the post-crisis approach has been something in between, um, something which combines public regulation with private standards and then buttresses both 
not with institutional responsibility, but with incentives that materially increase the accountability of individuals at the heart of the system. In the United Kingdom, new laws and regulations are doing just that. We have comp compensation reform that's aligning better risk and reward, including misconduct risk, um, with variable compensation deferred up to seven years and a potential to claw back up to a decade uh, in the most extreme cases. Um, we're also we've also introduced regulatory references so people can't job hop, staying one step ahead of misconduct, so people will know the misconduct histories of individuals they hire. Authorities have also used their convening power to encourage private sector, market participants, to come up with standards of market practice. Think the Global FX Code um, or the private um, Financial Market Standard Boards, a series of standards for FIC markets that are being put in place. And crucially, in the UK, something called the Senior Managers Regime gives teeth to these voluntary codes by incentivizing firms to embed them and reestablishing the link between seniority and accountability. Now, globally, the FSB has identified a similar menu of tools under its misconduct action plan, um, but thus far, um, action to promote good conduct has varied widely across the G20. And absent a more comprehensive response, it's hard to see how we can prevent the ethical drift which periodically undermines market integrity and impairs finance's ability to function effectively. And more fundamentally, I'd argue that without greater individual responsibility, it's hard to see how social capital cannot be fully re or can be fully re regained. So turning to the second lie that markets don't always clear, this has spurred probably the biggest uh, swath of uh, reforms and response with an objective to make markets less complex and more robust. Um, since the fall of Lehman um, and the panic in the derivative markets, the FSB has designed a series of reforms to make these markets safer and more transparent, including by requiring trade reporting and encouraging central clearing of all OTC trades or of standardized OTC trades. And these reforms are working. Market participants and authorities can now see what's actually going on in these markets. Um, and 90% of uh, single currency interest rate derivatives are now centrally cleared. And an additional $1 trillion of collateral is held globally against all derivative trades, despite lower overall risk. Central counterparties reduce systemic risk provided they meet the highest standards of resilience, recoverability, and resolvability. Um, and that's why we have instituted a series of reforms um, to increase that and also to increase operational resilience. I'd argue that now is the time, though, for FSB to, uh, and G20 countries to address any gaps in implementation of those standards um, and also to step back and assess whether taken together these reforms to the three R's, resilience, recovery, and recoverability, whether uh, they are accomplishing what they're intended to do and they're working together as efficiently as possible. Now, turning to another aspect of complexity, um, a series of measures uh, are eliminating uh, the most uh, fragile forms of shadow banking while reinforcing the best of market-based finance. Um, and I won't go into all those measures here, but they're making a real difference and, and you can see it in the uh, numbers. Um, but I would say that while the fault lines are closing or are closed uh, in shadow banking in advanced economies, they are widening in some emerging economies. For example, while China's economic miracle over the past three decades has been extraordinary, its post-crisis performance has increasingly relied on a large buildup of debt and a, an associated explosion of shadow banking. The non-bank financial sector in China has increased from around 10% of GDP a decade ago to over 100% now. With development, developments echoing those in the pre-crisis U.S., such as off-balance sheet vehicles with large maturity mismatches, sharp increase in repo financing, and large contingent liabilities of both borrowers and banks. More broadly, a potentially new vulnerability has emerged across the G20, including in advanced economy. And as often as the case, the risk starts with a fundamentally positive development. In this case, um, the developments in global assets under management, uh, they have grown from around 50 trillion a decade ago 
to over 80 trillion today. And this is good news. It brings uh, diversity to the system. It's helped fund all of the net lending to emerging economies as one example. However, asset management's growing importance could increase the risk of sudden stops and intense capital flow reversals in emerging markets amongst other markets. That's because more than 30 trillion of assets today are held in funds that promise daily liquidity to investors despite investing in potentially highly illiquid underlying assets. In other words, they're built on the lie that markets always clear. The FSB is committed to G20 leaders to address structural vulnerabilities in asset management. And to honor this commitment, there must be greater consistency between funds' redemption terms and their assets and investment strategies. And these funds should have the liquidity management tools to deal with stress conditions. My final uh, point in this section is on um, developments in global uh, leverage lending. Now, leverage lending globally is growing at, a, at rates and has reached a scale relative to overall credit markets and relative to underlying GDP that is comparable to subprime on the eve of the crisis. Underwriting criteria have loosened just as rapidly and there's limited information about the ultimate holders of the debt and their ability to absorb losses. And in recent years, courts have overturned the requirement that managers retain a portion of their securitizations. Now, to be clear, there are important differences between leverage lending and pre-crisis subprime. Not least, banks at the core of the system are much more resilient and they have limited direct and it would appear very limited indirect exposure to the asset class. And as well, the horizons of CLO investors appear to better match the underlying. Um, in other words, this liquidity mismatch issue I raised earlier um, is less present in leverage lending. But every time you see a major asset class develop and to grow consistently at double digit rates, you have to be careful. And I would remind, as some in this room know all too well, um, that the last two vintages of subprime were twice as, li as likely to default as their predecessors and that the leveraged lending market shows few s signs of slowing. So turning, turning finally to the lie that this time is different, um, if there's one thing the experience of living through the financial crisis should teach us all, it's humility. Um, and that means we can't anticipate every risk or plan for every contingency, but what we can do and must do is plan for failure. And that's how you work to create a more anti-fragile system, something that's uh, robust both the, to the intensification of known risks, such as the risks that I've tried to outline, but also to those sort of Rumsfeldian unknown unknowns. You start with resilient banks. That's what you need for such a system. Um, and regulation has made the banks more robust, less complex, uh, and more focused. Common equity requirements for the largest banks are 10 times their pre-crisis levels. Um, business strategies that relied on high leverage, risky trading activities or wholesale funding are disappearing as intended. Trading assets of the major banks have been cut in half. Interbank lending is down by two-thirds. They're focused more on lending to the real economy than to each other. And to give one example of the shift, contingent liquidity of the UK banks, own liquidity and contingent liquidity, only covered 10% of runnable assets in 2007. They cover 110% today. Now, higher capital and liquidity requirements are necessary but not sufficient conditions. Um, banks also need to be able to fail without systemic consequences. And so uh, to bring back the discipline of the market, and to end a reliance on public funds, FSB members have agreed standards to ensure global banks can do just that. And we're seeing, as those are put in place, as TLAC or bail inable debt is put in place, as banks restructure, we're seeing market discipline come back. Um, in the UK, the implied public su subsidy for our largest banks is down 90% on pre-crisis levels. But given the importance of this issue, uh, it's time again to take stock. And the FSB has uh, just agreed that we will undertake a thorough uh, uh, assessment of the effectiveness of the too big to fail reforms over the next year and report to G20 leaders on that. Now, 
it's not just about financial failures. A anti-fragile system must be as ro robust to operational failures. Um, and that brings me to cyber. Um, to improve cyber defenses, the largest banks and market infrastructure at the core of the UK system are now uh, subject to regular penetration tests and they have a list of remedial actions to address uh, the learnings from those. But there is an analogy with too big to fail. Uh, it's not enough just to improve the defenses, improve the resilience. We need to think about what happens when there's a successful uh, cyber attack, so to flip it around, literally plan for failure. Um, and we've begun to do that in the UK for, by setting standards for how quickly systemic financial institutions must be able to re restore vital services following a successful uh, attack. And we will be uh, conducting um, cyber uh, stress tests um, to test those. And we are working, I'll say in this room, we're working very closely with the US Treasury as co-chairs of the G7 Cyber Expert Group to develop and disseminate best practices uh, across the core of the global financial system. And the final thing that an anti-fragile system requires um, is what I would call a comprehensive macroprudential framework. Again, another phrase I can use in this room, but not many others. Um, now, macroprudential frameworks um, require authorities uh, to meet the next challenge, not just fight the, the last war, and so to ask themselves what could happen not engaged in the false comfort of uh, what's most likely to happen. Um, we have to consider the safety of the system as a whole. The system as a system uh, need to be uh, counter-cyclical and think about the macro-financial implications of imbalances in the real economy, such as in housing markets or in the balance of payments. Um, and I want to give you a topical example, uh, which is the Bank of England's approach to Brexit. Now, with respect to Brexit, the Bank of England doesn't focus on the most likely outcome, but rather the possible consequences of a disorderly cliff edge exit from the European Union, however unlikely that may be. So to be clear, the most likely outcome is a, is a deal um, and, a, and a smooth transition, but we assume that doesn't happen in terms of preparation. Um, and we start by ensuring that our banks are ready for Brexit, such a Brexit, and to do so, we use uh, severe uh, but plausible, uh, which means coherent, uh, stress tests. Uh, and in our stress test last year, to give you a sense of the orders of magnitude, UK GDP fell by 4.5%, commercial real estate by 40%, UK house prices by a third, uh, bank rate rose by 4 percentage points, and unemployment went from the low 4s to 9.5%. In addition, there was a major emerging market shock and substantial uh, misconduct costs for the banks, all at once. In our judgment, the judgment of the Bank of England and its independent financial policy committee, our stress test last year was severe enough to encompass the wide range of macroeconomic and financial risks that could happen, could be associated with a low probability disorderly uh, Brexit. The bottom line is that we judge that the UK banking system has the capacity to absorb not only the consequences of a no-deal, no-transition Brexit, but also losses that could be associated with intensifying global trade tensions, a sharp further tightening of financing conditions for emerging markets, and again, substantial additional misconduct costs. Liquidity is the second item of our uh, contingency planning. Um, and to give you some hard data on that, UK banks currently have around 300 billion pounds of borrowing capacity. They pre-position collateral uh, with the Bank of England that gives them 300 billion pounds of borrowing uh, capacity uh, from the Bank of England if they were to need it. Um, that more than matches our lending at the peak of the global financial crisis, even though the own liquidity positions of the UK banks, as I just mentioned, have improved tenfold since then. The third thing we do is to take a counter-cyclical approach. Um, in the UK, we have deployed uh, the counter-cyclical capital buffer uh, in which capital is accrued in good times in order to be released in bad or stressed uh, positions. Two years ago, immediately following the uh, referendum, uh, amidst a period of heightened uncertainty, we cut the CCYB, um, releasing a potential £150 billion of additional lending capacity for the banks. Um, 
as that uncertainty receded, the economy uh, grew, uh, we required the banks to rebuild it, and then some. And today, the, that capital buffer is twice as high, so we're in a position, if needed, um, to release $300 billion of lending capacity into the economy in the event of a stress condition. And the point is, uh, we will want UK households and businesses to be in a position with, with total confidence that if they have a good idea, um, they're in a position to buy a property, um, take out a loan, uh, that there will be capacity in the system to serve them. Now, the fourth thing we've done uh, over the course of the last year and a half, uh, we've done this publicly and transparently, is we've identified the major cross-border risks to financial services that could arise in the event of a cliff edge Brexit. And since then, there's been considerable progress in the UK to address these risks, but only limited progress in the European Union. In the limited time remaining in, uh, as we move towards uh, March 29th, 2019, it will not be possible, in our judgment, for companies to self-solve the risks of dis disruption to cross-border financial services. And so the need for authorities to take action now is pressing. For example, EU rules will restrict EU households and businesses from continuing to use financial services provided by UK firms. Um, and in some cases, particularly in insurance, um, UK companies have been restructuring, restructuring these contracts um, so they can continue to serve their clients. But even if all of those restructurings go through, 9 million EU policyholders will still be at risk after Brexit. In contrast, the UK government is taking forward legislation that will allow UK households and businesses to continue to access financial services provided by EU companies after Brexit. This solves all the issues for UK insurance policyholders, for EU firms operating in the UK, and for the use by UK firms, UK-based firms, of EU CCPs. Timely action by EU authorities is now needed to mitigate the financial risk to st financial stability, uh, particularly those associated with derivative contracts. Around $100 trillion do uh, of cross-border derivative contracts could be disrupted by the loss of EU regulatory uh, permissions if they don't. And these examples, I hope, um, illustrate a broader point that I want to make about our approach to Brexit, which is throughout the bank's preparations and the broader UK preparations, we've been clear that we will maintain the traditions that have underpinned the UK's position as a leading international financial centre. In particular, we'll maintain the current levels of resilience in the system and the commitment to openness. So let me conclude. 800 years of financial history teaches us that financial crises occur roughly once a decade. And that's a frequency that in part, not wholly, but in part reflects short institutional memories in finance. But our citizens haven't forgotten the last crisis, certainly not in the United Kingdom where real incomes are still below their levels prior to the crash. Or here in the United States, where confidence in banks remains near historic lows. The reforms of the past decade have put in place a new financial system which should and could, in time, regain that, re regain that uh, confidence of the people. However, the challenge for policymakers is that when it comes to financial stability, Success is an orphan, not failure. Success is an orphan. As memories fade, complacency sets in, and pressure to compromise reemerges. So we all, in the private sector and the public sector, bear heavy responsibilities to safeguard recent progress and address emerging vulnerabilities. Safeguarding progress, just to be clear, does not mean defending all aspects of that reform program at all costs. And that's why the FSB is now working um, to evaluate the reforms, see what's working as intended, see where there's unintended consequences, and then adjust those. And there will be specific recommendations that go into the Buenos Aires Summit to do just that. But we need to tailor, not taper. It's critical that the process of evaluation and adjustment doesn't compromise overall systemic resilience. Addressing emerging uh, vulnerabilities means having the foresight to anticipate new risks, whether they come from cyber, to CCPs, accountability, 
uh, to asset management. And it means having the discipline to build that anti-fragile system that's robust to risks that we don't anticipate. Now, the bottom line, as this room knows well, we won't abolish crises, but we can reduce their frequency and lessen their severity. And by resisting the three lies of finance and by voice, voicing truths seldom told, we can build a true finance which better serves our citizens in bad times as well as good. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mark. I thought that was very good. You, um, your basic message I found very reassuring, uh, which is that the Bank of England has thought through uh, the consequences of Brexit uh, and has the financial system in, in the UK kind of prepared for that. I thought that was a terrific core message of yours. Am I getting that wrong? Uh, you're getting that right. Okay. You're getting that right. Um, <laughs> I, hope that, I hope that was clear. I mean, we have been, as you would expect, um, we have been focused on that for, from, from the day of the referendum, and uh, you know, we should be held to account if we're not prepared for it. So, uh, but your other message is you think Europe has work to do. Well, there's, there's a couple specific issues, and, uh, uh, that, and we are working uh, directly with the uh, ECB, with uh, President Draghi and myself, uh, chair of working group, uh, uh, scoping out these issues. The decisions are taken by uh, different parts of um, uh, the Europe European uh, institutional framework. Um, and, um, you, you know, uh, I, these are constructive discussions and one would expect the issues to be addressed, uh, but they are important issues. And, you know, we're in a, we're, we're in a day and age of um, transparency uh, that's expected of central, rightly expected of central banks, authorities such as the Bank of England, um, that uh, we have to expose these issues um, and make sure there's common understanding of them. Um, the private sector has perspectives on these, a number of uh, banking associations, individual institutions have raised these issues now uh, publicly, and then uh, you know the powers that be have to address them. Yes. So um, let's say that your uh, the outcome is in the middle of the road between the kind of scenarios that one's worked out. Um, I'm not asking you to make a political judgment because yeah. I know that you're, you, know, you you won't do that. Yeah. So let's just assume that you get something that's relatively close to the checkers plan or something that's kind of a muddle through between that and the hard Brexit. What do you think, uh, what would you identify in that middle of the road outcome as the key stresses to the system that the Bank of England would need to be prepared to deal with? Well, I think, uh, and, and I appreciate you're not pushing me on, on, in some respects, the unknowable because the- well, I'm happy to ask because, you that, Well, you can ask me, but I don't, you know. <laughs> we don't know. We, we don't know. It's right. a negotiation and, uh, and there's many factors that are there and leave it to the to, to the political side, it's a fundamentally political issue which ultimately has to be decided by the various parliaments as well or, or approved by the various parliaments. Um, in a, in a, a scenario of an agreement, um, there aren't really stresses, I mean this is the thing, there won't be stresses in the system because an agreement to um, some form of future economic partnership, however, where, wherever it is on the spectrum, uh, what would come with that is a, a transition period to that which will help the financial sector to, uh, uh, you know, adjust to uh, new realities. And I would say as well that in the case of um, uh, a free trade agreement or a checkers agreement or other partnership, there is a range of financial, long-term financial uh, uh, arrangements that could be there, which are all subject to negotiation on our decision. Um, the, the issues arise if there's no agreement and there's no transition to what is called a WTO world, so a world where we just uh, uh, trade under WTO. That's uh, what people terms. are calling the no deal that, hard Brexit. That's a no deal hard Brexit, and that uh, in the absence of an, uh, of an agreement uh, in, the, uh, in the coming months, um, it would happen at, on the 29th of, of March. Now, we have, I, I, you know, we're preparing for the worst. That's the worst case scenario. We prepare for that. Uh, and, and I said, you know, carefully, however unlikely that may be. Right. Both sides, You've emphasized both that. sides are absolutely working to make sure right. that that doesn't happen. But until there is an agreement, you have to prepare, prepare for the alternative. Good. So um, let's talk about the longer term. Mm. Uh, not as long term as it might take for the Oilers to win the Stanley Cup. 
Uh, but it's his Connor team. McDavid. That's I mean, his team. Yeah. yeah, they did to beat the Bruins. They last beat the Bruins night. last, night. Beat the Bruins last night. night. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they'll beat him again if they want to have a rematch. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, you have a um, share with us your views about uh, your longer term vision post Brexit. Let's see. You, let's assume you have a reasonable Brexit. Yeah. You manage your way through it. I know that you have some views about the uh, longer term well, I, financial services economy and um, UK a broader UK economy. Well, I think the um, so if if one takes a Brexit agnostic view, so whatever is agreed in the in the fullness of time, um, the UK system will adjust. I think that, you know from our perspective, there there are a couple of things, and I mentioned uh, two of them in the speech. First is uh, the UK the the standards in the UK will continue to exceed international standards. So it's very important for that system uh, to be resilient. Uh, it's one of the most important global hubs, you know, alongside New York, uh, the, the two most important global hubs. Unlike, so, the, U uh, unlike the U.S., if I may, though. Okay. So we have a system in the U.K., which is the aggregate size is 10 times GDP. Uh, it's a different order of magnitude relative to GDP as, as in the sure. U.S. So it's that much more important that we maintain these standards. You're talking so, about the financial services so, economy part of the overall UK economy. And the assets relative size of GDP. So right. you, you have to have a system where you've addressed too big to fail, where you have resilient hubs such as uh, CCPs, uh, and, that, uh, and that the markets are, are robust enough, and that the, the, the domestic financial system, and it literally is now, as of this year, ring fence from the rest. So high standards of resilience, first point. Second, a fundamental belief in openness. Um, and uh, I, one of the things, one of the points I'd like to make is that, and this is very much you know, UK government policy, but I think it's sound um, financial policy, is uh, here in the US, in the UK, and in a number of other jurisdictions, there's been this whole reform process for the last 10 years. Um, and uh, standards have been substantially uh, raised everywhere. And we now are in a position where you could have much freer trade in financial services. You know, we should be able to rely on each other much more. Um, we know what uh, standards people are holding themselves to. You have better supervisory cooperation. You have better information. And so with like-minded jurisdictions, uh, like the U.S., like, like a Canada, like uh, Japan, and we expect, like Europe, um, you can have free flow, freer flow of financial services. And I think the U.K. has a fundamental commitment to openness. If I can give a short-term example of that, with Brexit, uh, a year ago, we said, look, we are going to effectively authorize European entities into the UK um, under the standards that, that we have had in the past. Uh, and we're going to presume that we have a supervisory cooperation. We're going to presume openness, presume cooperation. And it's only if we're disabused of that over time that we would, we, we would ring fence parts of the system. So I, I don't anticipate that. I think the, I think the I'll make two other points, though, with it. One, I, I do think, you know, the UK is the fintech hub in Europe, one of the most important fintech hubs uh, in the world. And I, I, I do think both on the wholesale and the re retail side, there's real potential um, for um, uh, not just development there in the UK, but export of, of those technologies and business models. Um, and then the last is just on, you know, cross-border emerging market flows will continue, should continue to come through London, local currency, international markets, and those run in the extreme of this, which could become mainstream. So the flip side of wealth management, trust, funding, you know, uh, Chinese municipal infrastructure and energy infrastructure, which is a less stable model, is um, local currency, you know, green bonds um, that are listed internationally and, and, and domestically, which is, you know, potentially a, uh, 50 to 100 uh, billion uh, per year market in the next few years. Those are the types of markets that internationally flow through London as well as onshore. So you see a path, despite the dire forecasts of uh, recent years, through Brexit to maintain the primacy of London in the financial world financial system. I think, you know, in, to retain the primacy, you've got to get the first principles right, resilience, openness. Allow, and then allow innovation. That's right? the path. And that's the path. Right. And I, uh, my view is that that, you know, you know, that that is the path the UK will take. Those are the first principles. Those are the reflex actions. And that um, the measures we've collectively taken over the last 10 years reinforce all of those. So let's move to the broader uh, world economy a bit. Okay. Um, you're just back from Bali, as you said. Yeah. Um, I worked working all the time. 
Is that right? Yeah, sir? I was. You didn't take a bathing suit with you? I didn't use it. <laughs> <laughs> um, there you gave a speech where you warned against, against quote unquote, the weaponization of assets in a global financial system. Right. Uh, as I got it right, you stressed the need for investment flows to remain open um, in light of the risk of U.S. protectionism that could affect the real economy through trade flows, supply chains, import costs. Can you elaborate a little, or correct and or yeah, elaborate yeah, a little I bit on that? I tried to summarize a complicated I had a slightly, slightly different uh, recollection of that, which, uh, of course, I had the advantage of being there, and you weren't, but the... And, um, and saying it and, yourself. And saying it myself. I, I, was, <laughs> I, was, uh, I, was answering a, I was answering a question um, which was about, um, which was about uh, those, those financial issues. Um, and I think I'd make two points, if I can, around um, trade and open finance. Um, the first is... I, I referenced a moment ago free trade and financial services. Right. And if I could broaden that out to freer trade and services. So, um, you know, as we all know, a series of uh, trade, um, trade disputes, uh, trade discussions across the world, uh, many of which have the U.S. at, at the center. A uh, lot of the discussion has focused on the good side, you know, uh, manufactured goods trade. Um, and the point we've tried to make in the last several years, um, which is beginning to get some traction, some traction, is that uh, if you liberalized services trade by the same amount that goods trade has been liberalized over the course of the last 10, 15 years, um, you'd cut the U.S. deficit in half. Okay? Just the same amount. Cut the U.S. deficit in half. Uh, The IMF came out with some analysis uh, in Bali, actually, uh, and uh, they said if you did it in the global economy, you'd liberalize services, same proportion, down by about 15%, which are non-tariff barriers, not tariff barriers, as you know. Um, then you would add $350 billion to the world economy equivalent of another South Africa. Okay? That's sort of so a these Pareto are big, optimization. But it's a big, these are big numbers, and this is, I mean, this is the unliberalized um, bit of the global economy. Right. It is a positive leveling up agenda as opposed to, if you will, leveling down through protectionism around goods. Um, it's, in many respects, the future of trade because it's financial services, it's data, it's creative, you know, creative services, um, and... And, and getting those rules right is the opportunity. And again, to be, you know, glass, my glass is almost totally full. It's not just half full here, but uh, is um, the, uh, all this progress on finance, you know, well, what was the purpose of it? Yes, serve our, 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 our citizens better, but also really take a big step, potentially, for a broader, broader uh, openness in, 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 in finance. Now, to get to the, the more dangerous second part of your uh, question, which is around um, uh, the interplay between financial services and, um, and uh, foreign policy um, and sanctions, um, I mean, I think I'll, I'll limit my response to absolute importance of uh, the highest standards of anti-money laundering, counterterrorism finance, um, first point. The second point, that being truly effective AML CTF, um, and in order to be truly effective in AML CTF, uh, we're increasingly of the view that a series of, of um, reforms um, and measures, uh, financial technology measures, are necessary to do that. Um, and I'll give you one example so it's tangible, it's not just words. Um, so one of the things we're doing is we're changing our entire uh, payment system, the core of our payment system, large value. $600 billion a day, sterling goes through the core of the Bank of England. Um, we are going to require, we're consulting on this, but it's likely to happen, that every payment has to have something called an LEI associated with it. Now, legal ad- entity identifier, those uh, mm-hmm. in the financial services would know this, put in place for the derivative market. There's 1.2 million of them now in the world. But so for every corporate transaction that comes through, you got an LER. That's absolute know-your-customer transparency. What we would like is everyone to do that. That attached then across the payment system. Attached across right. the payment system. You know who's on whose behalf right. is coming, and that's a big step. It doesn't deal with all the individual issues, but it deals with the corporate issues, or it starts to deal. And it's those kind of building blocks which, quite frankly, you know, five, ten years ago, you couldn't do. You right. didn't have the technology to do. Now you can do it. You put it in place. And that starts to address some of the underlying flows at which sanctions look to get. Gotcha. Interesting. Okay, so global macro outlook, and that's something else you yeah. think a little bit about. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, perhaps the biggest change uh, happening 
ramifying around the world today is, is a policy change at the, balance, at the Federal Reserve Bank. Balance sheet normalization, interest rates um, on the path upwards. Um, talk, let's talk about the risk to the global markets and the economy from all that. Um, starting perhaps, I was going to ask you about uh, emerging markets to begin with, because that's obvious, but right now everybody's focused on Italy. Uh, and the um, question someone asked me in preparation of this is, why would anybody buy an Italian bond today when you can't be assured of ECB support and when U.S. rates are rising and might be, on a risk-adjusted basis, much more attractive? Uh, well, I'm not going to give uh, investment advice uh, in general, and certainly not to, not I'm, to, you, not you, to this you know room. You know where I'm but, going. Yeah, I know, I, well, <laughs> I know where you're going. But, uh, <laughs> um, well, let's say a couple of things. Uh, first is that... Um, uh, Let's acknowledge, uh, as you would, why is the Fed on the path they're on, um, and they're on the path they're on for you know fundamentally um, good, uh, positive reasons. Uh, yeah, it's good news. Strength, yeah, it's good news. Strength of the U.S. economy, uh, you know, potentially a four percent annualized quarter this quarter, um, you know, uh, uh, and uh, the return of uh, both um, wage uh, wage growth and with that um, a firming of underlying inflation and pressure. So fundamentally good story now. Uh, like anyone, uh, any other central bank, they have their challenges in calibrating and, and looking forward. Um, and, um, and I have every confidence that they'll get it um, uh, absolutely right. Um, it's, it's, and as they do of us, because it's a, this tight mutual admiration society among central bankers. But the, the, alongside this, I'm going to make two other points, if I may. Um, one is that you alluded to balance sheet normalization. And it is a big swing in terms of the flow between uh, if you take the G4 central banks, include the Bank of England in that, you look at the flow of fiscal uh, uh, mm -hmm. policy. Um, you know, uh, for the last four years, um, basically no net debt added between, the, between Europe, Japan, the U.S., uh, and the U.K. because the purchases, not evenly right. spread, took it all out. Uh, now we flip to a trillion, roughly a trillion this year, probably a trillion five, maybe uh, almost two uh, next year of net debt added. That's right. a, that's, that's without a big, that buyer in the that, market. Without that buyer. That, you know, that's right. a big that's swing. That's a big deal. That's, that's a big swing. Um, and it's being done for the right reasons, and it's positive development, but the market's got to, got to adjust to that. Um, in terms of um, whether it's Italy um, you know, or uh, a, 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 corporate, a large corporate credit or emerging market sovereign, um, why would you, you know, why would you buy the, um, uh, why would you buy the asset? I mean, the first question is, why would you buy the asset? Is, are, are they going to pay it back? I mean, again, whether it's a bank or a corporate, or you, you've got to make that fundamental credit judgment. And of course, there is. I mean, I'm telling you this, but you know, there's a, there's a risk with, with everybody in terms of likelihood, um, uh, from the United States down to, you know. Um, uh, the smallest issuer out of uh, out of a volatile emerging market, uh, and you have to make that judgment. The judgment shouldn't be based on whether or not the central bank is going to be there to uh, to take you out. Now there may be a reason for the central bank to be in that market, but you know, we're moving back to a world, uh, and this is fundamentally good news, where fundamental credit analysis, um, uh, thinking through the cycle, recognizing there's an economic cycle. If, and the financial cycle comes back on top of that, where those judgments, those skills, those judgments are going to increasingly have to be made, as opposed to quasi-emergency policies of central banks providing that, that, that support. Um, so yes, that makes it a little harder, makes those judgments harder, but it will, it will bring back a discipline to the market that's welcome. You talked in your remarks about um, I, I, the qu quote I wrote down, when it comes to financial stability, success is an orphan. Uh, by the way, I'm going to steal that. Uh, as memories fade, complacency sets in. Uh, and talked about future financial crises as the four, four different dimensions. Yeah. But aren't there, couldn't one argue that there, there are financial crises occurring in the world today right now? Uh, places like uh, Argentina, Turkey, and South Africa. Yeah. Uh, and talk a little bit about how the pressure on emerging markets from the capital flow reversals yeah, that are coming from these dynamics you're talking so, about. So, so that's, I mean, that's one of the biggest, in my judgment, one of the biggest macro questions right now. Right is, now, yeah, yeah, is the is the question of. So we've seen this tightening in financial conditions. I think it would be acknowledged that in in the first two countries on your list, um, uh, that there were some domestic factors, some idiosyncratic factors that made things worse as opposed to a generalized. But we're we're now seeing. 
as we've always seen with Fed tightening cycles, um, that there is uh, an element of capital flow reversal, that um, the tightening in financial conditions for emerging markets is more than one-to-one -one than the tightening in the United States. Um, normally, the tightening in credit markets is more than one-to-one -one than the tightening mm -hmm. with the underlying. Um, there has been a lag for this happening. This has been an unusual tightening cycle, and it's taken a while for that to happen, but now it's started. It's likely to continue. Um, and we have seen capital flow reversals. And one of the questions, which I raise and don't fully answer, is how, how given that all the net lending flow was out of daily, effectively out of daily liquidity, uh, you know, mutual funds and others, uh, ETFs, others, into emerging, how, when that pulls back, does that amplify the normal dynamics that uh, you expect to see? Now, so that's, that is, um, in many respect, it's a natural development. It's a product of the way the system is. The way, as, as an individual emerging economy, you, you lessen the risk on that, and a number of them have done this. It's better to have borrowed in your own currency. It's better to have a flexible exchange rate. It's better to have a proper macro framework, inflation targeting framework, credibility of your, of, of your institutions, and um, most of the big ones do have that. But it, you know, it's a test. And the, and the macro question, apart for those individuals, um, you know, these are economies that 15, 20 years ago, t Latin American debt cycle, I, or crisis I mentioned, uh, 20 years ago, we were talking less than 40% of global GDP. Well, now it's 60% of global GDP. And, the, and, the, and the, so the spillover from the US and then the spill back to the core, to the US, and uh, will, you know, will be, um, how material will that be? And it's as yet unanswered, but it is a consideration. And I think the Fed is, has acknowledged this um, and, and takes it into consideration, not because of some global benevolence, not, not taking on the problems of emerging economies, but they're recognizing the, in, the greater interconnectedness of the system. So I think, Brock, we have time for one more question. One last, one last question, OK. Um, so many asked. This has been a fascinating conversation. So much we could talk to you. But you, you highlighted four key potential risks looking forward. I thought your remarks were very, uh, very useful in terms of looking forward rather than looking backward. Uh, you talked about China, daily liquidity on, on, on the assets under management, cyber, and uh, leverage lending. Yeah. Right. Um, but you've also talked separately about climate change. Uh, and you're, I think, unusually, particularly for a central banker, vo vocal about that issue and the potential, quote unquote, catastrophic impact it could have on the financial system. You want to talk a little bit about? Yeah, that? well, uh, and Bob Steele's here, who's uh, chair of the SASB, um, so knows this, knows this better than I do. Um, the, but from our perspective, from a, you know, so a couple of points of context. First, Bank of England regulates the fourth largest insurance sector in the world. We regulate Lloyd's of London. So we see property and casualty reinsurance. We see this, you know, the best risk managers of climate change risk are the reinsurers and the PNC insurers. They see it every day. They change the pricing. They change the coverage. Okay, so we see it. Um, for the core of the system, banks uh, and the system as a whole, the biggest risk is not physical risk, the manifestation of a, a hurricane or uh, the impact of uh, extreme weather on, uh, or unpredictable weather on supply chains, although that is a risk. The biggest risk is the transition from here to the future, um, uh, and particularly transition from a high carbon to a low carbon right. economy, right? And is that transition going to happen late? Is there going to be a Minsky moment in climate, or is it going to happen relatively smoothly? The key component for it to happen relatively smoothly is not for regulators to start dictating to asset managers or banks or others how to manage climate risk in the future, but is for those institutions to have the information they need to make a judgment about who's managing this risk, who's not, uh, what their current fit footprint is, what it could be in the future, where they see opportunities, where they don't. And um, under Michael Bloomberg, um, the uh, Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, which is entirely private sector, has come up with the disclosures that they think companies should disclose. As of today, there's $100 trillion of assets backing that disclosure. So 25 systemic banks, 8 of 10 of the top asset managers, uh, Glass, Lewis, and ISS as the proxy firm, and on and on, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, saying, we want this disclosure. Um, and our point 
is, as a regulator, is we want a market in transition. Because some people think it's a big issue, others think it's less of an issue. Some people think governments are going to more or less come through on their commitments. Others think policy will lag. But you don't have an ability to express that, those views as you want it in a market until you get the proper disclosure. So our job has been to get that disclosure out there. Uh, there has been tremendous progress under, under Mike's leadership. Private sectors picked this up. Now the asset side is looking for it. And um, I think uh, investors are disclosing. If I can make one last point, which is a point for the judgment of people like yourselves and others in this room and beyond, is that one of the questions is of uh, you know, this whole sort of movement towards long-term value creation. You think about BlackRock's initiatives, uh, Vanguard's initi other initiatives around this. And the question is, OK, is there a correlation be between managements and, 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 and firms that think about structural issues like climate, like uh, the impact of artificial intelligence, like demographics, like the emergence of China? Other, is there a correlation between that and, and, and creating long-term value? There's a big chunk of the market that thinks there is. And this is part of the way to uh, give the information to see that. I think it's lunchtime, Mark. Thank All you right. very much. Well done. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.